So welcome to tonight's uh, webinar and uh, we're going to be having a look at the evolving role of CBCT in adaptive radiotherapy. Uh, so my name is Mark Collins and I'm part of the um, academic team at SHU and um, I've got quite a big interest in, in this area. So my, my clinical background is um, within dosimetry rather than as a radiographer but um, I'm quite heavily involved in the teaching at kind of pre-reg and post-reg of, of IGRT and uh, my doctorate that I'm in the process of writing up is around decision making in IGRT. So um, it's definitely something that I've uh, got a real interest in and I'm hoping to share some of that interest with you tonight. So I thought um, this image that I put on here really kind of sets the scene in terms of what I want to do tonight. So whenever you do a presentation, you clearly spend a bit of time looking for an image to put on the front cover to grab people's attention. And actually, I think this one does it all for me. So it shows all of you guys across the world that are involved in this uh, shook. And... Um, I think it's great that such a widespread we've got and um, I'm hoping to pull on that tonight. So my experience is very much limited to the UK and a lot of what I talk about tonight is going to be around the UK so I'd be really keen for those of you outside the UK to get in involved as well and share some of your experiences and how some of the things that I talk about links to practice all over the world. So we've only got kind of 20, 25 minutes for this first bit and I could probably spend about four hours talking about this presentation. So it's a real whistle stop tour and really what I'm wanting to do is introduce what I think are some of the key concepts and then leave plenty of time at the end for discussion. I'm really kind of conscious that um, some of you are going to have little or no experience of CBCT, others of you will be will be real experts and so what I've tried to do is put something together that will hopefully benefit everybody so we start off at the beginning um, very much about introducing the subject but then towards the end we get up to some kind of the current literature and, and where I think we're going with this and so I'm hoping it'll give us plenty of ideas for, for questions and discussion um, towards the end. So one text that I think all radiographers, physicists, medics should read, um, I think it's a real seminal text, is this. So published in 2012, so a few years old, um, but it's got a really nice kind of uh, breakdown of, of how we implement this new technology into our departments. And this is kind of what it talks around very early on about where we're going. And there's very much this aim towards the modern 4D adaptive radiotherapy, which has a huge kind of, within that, there's a huge role for IGRT and certainly cone beam CT. And so another thing that would be nice to talk about later on is, is where we are in this, in terms of on this roadmap and how much you think we're actually um, doing. So the first section I'd like to have a think about is the equipment for the job. So what is CBCT? How does it work? And a little bit about how we use it. But before we do that, I thought it was worth just showing you this image here, um, which I came across a while ago. Um, and this is quite a nice textbook uh, that talks around uh, image guided radiotherapy. So it's taken out of here. And it's really kind of looking back um, over kind of CT imaging history to see where we are compared to, to where we were. And you can see that we've come a long, long way in, I don't think, that much time. So in the 70s, we were talking about Cormac and, and Hounsfield developing the early CT scanners. And then you can see there only in like the late 1990s, we had four slice CT scanners. Um, uh, four slice multi detector scanners, and then only in like um, mid 2000s, uh, before 2010, we're starting to get to these very high multi slice scanners. And you can see that C cone beam CT with a flat panel detector hasn't been around that long, so kind of just before 2000. And uh, one of the early papers that, 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 that looks at it, um, this is an image from that. And you can see that this was from, from 2002. So we've come quite a, quite a long way, I think, since 2002 to, to where we are. So what was the drive in, towards CBCT? And I think these images probably tell us quite a lot. So those of us that have got some experience at looking at these will we'll straight away see that they're uh, 2D images taken from an EPID. Uh, so electronic portal imaging device and these are taken from 
um, an elector machine and those of us that are used to squinting um, we can probably make out a reasonable amount on there in terms of that's a, a pelvis for those, those of us that aren't that familiar we can see we've got the field edge here and we've got some bony anatomy here. so we've got the sacrum there and, and the femur um, and the the kind of anterior part of the bony pelvis there and um, we can see we can we can take these images two ways either using a, um, a single image or a double exposure which is what we've got here so you can see some anatomy outside of the field as well um, and we can see quite a bit in there if, we, if we're used to looking at them we can certainly match to some bony anatomy for um, using that as a surrogate for where the tumor may be but actually we in terms of what's going on inside the patient there's not a huge amount we can see there I don't think and um, with the addition of maybe some fiducials then again we can certainly localize the tumor itself but then have very little information in terms of um, soft tissue and, and that's really what I would argue we need moving forward in within radiotherapy so if you were um, looking to buy some new equipment then this is these are probably the two at the top of your shopping list I would guess although there is a, a few other um, models out there and some uh, might argue that there's some other technology out there to, to, to compete with this but the two main manufacturers obviously being Electa and Varian Electa calling theirs the Versa HD and Varian the, the, the Truby machine So this is a slightly older um, piece of kit, this is an Electa machine, and we're going to have a look at um, the acquisition of some images in a second, um, but just to kind of label a couple of things on, on, on this Linac, um, so we've got the obviously the, the Linac head with the mega voltage source, and we've got a amorphous silicon detector there, and then we on a separate arm we've got a KV source, again with a an amorphous silicon detector opposite and we can rotate both of these um, around the patient typically you would use one or the other and um, allows us to some acquire some images in 3d so for those of us that aren't familiar with with this at all this is a uh, varian machine and in a second you're going to see this is the kv source uh, coming out now and then the detector directly opposite that and this is um, acquiring an image of a phantom you'll see that it can uh, in a second it's going to start rotating around the phantom and as it rotates it's producing a cone beam which it can then uh, reconstruct into a, a 3d image so this will become much clearer in a second when I show you some some images so rather than um, what we might see in a CT scanner where we have a fan beam and um, this one here where we have a, a line of detectors um, opposite the source in the CT scanner and the tube spins around and the patient moves through that beam and acquires the image spirally. Um, a cone beam image you can see here is a is a 3D um, cone shape I guess hence the name and then that's collected on the detectors on the other side and so it's so it's a much broader beam. So if we were to look down the kind of, um, as in like a beam's eye view, down the head of the Linac as it was acquiring that, this is what we'd, we'd, we'd see. So you, this is obviously speeded up quite a bit. So it's collecting lots and lots of projections. And then as those projections are reconstructed, we get this next image here, which is, is quite nice, I think. So this shows you how all those different projections are all reconstructed together to form our 3D image. So in terms of the different image kind of qualities, um, obviously if we have KV imaging, um, then we're going to get that much better soft tissue definition. So we can see the, the MV image here, so some departments still only have this available, and this still tells us, I would argue, much more than we would get from a 2D planar image, but there's, there's a little bit of issues, I'd say, in terms of soft tissue definition. Probably better in places where there's lots of bone um, and soft tissue contrast, maybe in the head and neck, but in the pelvis, it's um, in certain areas, we, we lose that contrast. Um, whereas with KV, um, with the lower energy, we get the, obviously the photoelectric effect, and so we can see here, I think these are really, really nice images. So this is obviously a prostate patient, 
taken from the uh, Electra XVI software and I think you can see quite a bit of detail there in terms of, of the soft tissue. So what we can do is overlay the uh, essentially the planning scan onto the cone beam CT scan. So this is an example for one patient and you can see the little bit of difference in quality between the planning scan and the CBCT but we can put our contours on and we can overlay one image on top of the other to allow us to compare the, the two to look for any changes. Now on the left hand side is the Alexa software where you're a little bit limited in terms of um, how you can view the images but um, you can see here there's kind of a color wash display set up here and the pink image is what it looked like when it's planned and the green what it looks like on, on the day and then that allows us to look for positional errors. The variance software, this is taking a couple of screen ups from ARIA, you have a few more um, options in terms of how you can view the images. So this is kind of a checkered board, this is a, a, a window within a window where you can move that around and then there's also quite a funky kind of uh, color wash in terms of looking at the differences between the two and so they both essentially look to do exactly the same thing compare one image on top of the other however they both obviously the interfaces are, are a little bit different between the two and I, I guess it's not for me to comment in terms of which one I think is uh, is the best so I've got a short video here just to show you how uh, the images can be um, Oops, sorry, how the images can be compared with each other. So this is obviously a brain patient, a post-op uh, brain. So you can see the pink is what the patient positioned when they were planned. The green is on the day. And you can either uh, manually manipulate um, the images, as has been done here, or there's an option to... Um, carry out an automatic registration here and you can see here that you can see um, quite a bit of detail even though in the brain um, there's obviously not a lot of soft tissue you can see here that within this patient they were offering quite a way in um, translationally um, and also with a with a rotation here so um, it allows us to correct for that so what can we see with, with uh, cone beam CT? Um, so this is obviously an example where there's been a pretty gross change in patient anatomy from their planning scan to their uh, scan on this first fraction. So this was a patient that had a collapsed lung uh, when they came for their planning scan. The lung's now reinflated and you can see the, uh, the, the, the fissure of the lobe there. And so some pretty gross changes there. So straight away we can see that that, that patients pretty instantly a replan. I'd be really interested actually to see what this patient would look like if it had just been a 2D epid and actually how much we would see there. I suspect we would probably see some changes but certainly not as, as graphic as that. We can also see some more subtle changes. Um, so this is quite a large tumour um, and still a reasonable amount of kind of sh tumour shrinkage here um, as this is, is part way through treatment. So as well as giving us that positional error that we, we've always been able to see in terms of using 2D um, anatomy, although arguably we've always been matching to, to a surrogate, um, i.e. bone, we can see all this soft tissue change within this patient. And this patient's having a, a, a really good response to treatment by the look of that. Obviously that poses questions in terms of, of what we need to do next and I've just got a, a short video here of 4D cone beam CT of a, of a lung now this is quite an old image so um, in terms of when this was first introduced into my, de my old department a number of years ago um, and the image quality is pretty poor as you can see um, and I'm sure it'll be a little bit better now but we can see there that this was a tumour that moved a huge amount so this was a tumour in the uh, the lower lobe and you can see it moving up and down there despite the image quality you can see that tumour moving quite clearly you can see it's, it's falling within that ITV and um, to give us some confidence in, in those margins that we've, we've used. And again, I don't think we'd, we'd well, we certainly wouldn't be able to see that with, with 2D imaging. So that's been a bit of, as I say, a, a, a pretty quick whistle stop tour of, of, of cone beam CT. 
um, and what the images look like. Um, I'd like to move now on to two kind of, I guess, what we might call slightly more advanced um, topics. Uh, something that, that maybe some of us are doing and some of us aren't doing. And I'd be interested to know who's doing what in terms of these these next few things I'm going to talk about. So what about dose then? So when you get your Linac um, with your CBCT, um, it'll come with um, preset protocols in terms of dose. Um, and um, they may like something like this. So this is taken from uh, a Bajold paper, uh, which is a paper I've put at the end actually as some recommended reading. This is a, a really nice paper actually that gives an overview of IGRT and, and patient outcome. And you can see here when we're looking at the dose to the patient that we're talking um, for a KV, uh, potentially two to three uh, centigrade and with an MV, uh, 5 to 15 centigrade so quite a big range there so um, although arguably quite low um, certainly if we're doing this for a number of times um, throughout treatment and certainly if we're moving towards daily imaging and um, with particular patient groups then I think this is something that we need to probably get on our radar a little bit more and something that's probably not been on the on the radar enough and um, I've got some images here from uh, from uh, Dr. Andrew Riley, and he presented these at a, a conference I attended a while ago, and I was really taken by them, so I wanted to to share them with you. So this is an example of a of a pediatric patient um, in his centre that they were concerned about the dose and were looking to see if they could uh, reduce the dose in the patient. Um, because of, of of the size of the field of view and the um, the age of the patient who was was very young, so this was their standard protocol, a hundred percent dose, and you can see the image quality that we get there. If they reduce uh, the dose, so put on a low dose protocol, you can see here that we get a slight reduction in um, image quality compared to the last one. Let me flip back between the two. I'd argue not a lot, but we've had over a 70% decrease in dose, which is which is pretty huge, isn't it? We can then um, reduce the dose even more, so what we might call a very low dose. So we're, we're losing that quality even more there, but again, still quite a bit of definition between bone and soft tissue. And I guess what we need to look at now is what are we actually verifying to? Are we verifying to bone or are we verifying to, to soft tissue? So we're down to 15% of what the original dose was. If we reduce the scan length a little bit more, we can reduce it down to 12% of the original dose. And if we reduce it even more, so just comb around the area that we're really concerned with in terms of treating, we're down to 10% of the original dose. And then if we reduce the image quality again, maybe getting a little bit borderline now, we're down even further. And then the last image I wanted to show you, we're down to 4.5% of the original dose. So we've lost over 95% of the dose to that patient. Now we've clearly lost some image quality there. And I'll leave it for you to decide at what point you think that image quality becomes a problem. Um, I would argue that we can certainly reduce it down um, in this region here without a shadow of a doubt. If we're just matching to bone, then we, then we could probably reduce it more, I would say. Um, so I think that really gives us something to think about there in terms of this is something we should be working as an MDT to, to, to reduce um, the dose to our patient when we're, when we're delivering or when we're using comb beam CT and really have this on our radar and be conscious of it. I think um, these are also from Dr. Riley, and I, th I think these two um, statements are quite profound, actually, but are true. So we, we talk about image quality being really important, and it is, but at what level do we need that image quality? We don't need diagnostic, I would argue, we don't need diagnostic image quality images because we're not diagnosing the patient. We need radiotherapy quality images in order to for the task we want. So depending what that task is, if we're, we're matching to soft tissue, that might be different to if we're matching to bone. And I'll certainly open the floor up to discussion around this. But I really think there's there's some balance to be had there between the dose we're delivering the patient and the image quality. And that's very much for you as a department. Um, and I guess us as a profession though, to, to, to come together and, and think about this this a little bit more. 
So the next thing I wanted to think about was adaptive planning, and this is really where we're starting to move towards. I'm not sure we're really there, certainly at the UK at the moment, clinically, but there's lots of publications um, out there from the last couple of years, so there's, there's certainly people are thinking about this and trying to get it clinically implemented. So let's just have a think about some of the concepts. So this is probably where we are now in terms of imaging. So we uh, have a treatment plan, we image our patient, we potentially shift them, we then deliver our dose. And we can do that maybe for the first three fractions and then weekly, or we may do daily imaging. Um, but we're very much looking at that patient shift in order to get correct the position. What adaptive radiotherapy does is really take us to this, this next level. So we take images daily and we have a similar process before. So we image, plan modification, deliver the dose, and then we, um, so rather than just doing a patient shift, sorry, we're actually looking to modify that dose. We then deliver it. We record that dose from that fraction and any previous fractions. We then image the next day, modify the plan, dose deliver. So we're really bringing this dose um, delivery and plan modification into our process, which has, I think, some potentially huge changes um, to, to our profession and, and potentially to, to patient outcome. But I think probably the, the thing that's holding us back at the moment is, is partially technology and, and resources. So I've just got a few slides here to, to talk about maybe some of the technology that's out there. Um, as I've said before, this is, is quite a big subject and, and try to squeeze this into five minutes is a little bit tricky. Um, so I'm having to kind of skip a, a little bit about what I'd like to talk about. But we, we've essentially acquired our images and we've got our cone beam image and our planning image. And we may do a manual match or um, a rigid match as, as we've done before, i.e. putting one image on top of the other and doing some translational correction. Actually, where we're probably moving is towards some sort of deformable registration, whereby we have two images and we're able to morph them in, in 2D, if, if that's the word. So you can see here we've got uh, two images here that we'd like to register on top of each other. So we've, we've done that with a rigid registration. So just put one on top of the other. And where you can see this, these grey marks is where there's still differences. We put it into the black box that is the deformal algorithm. You can see that what this is showing is kind of a, a map of where they've morphed the image. So if this was just a rigid algorithm, then all these lines with all these dots would be in line with each other it then this is what the new image looks like and the, the gray bits are where the differences are so we've still got quite a bit of difference but actually it's much more spread out and those colors are kind of much lighter that, that signify that the differences are very very small um, I would argue there's a few issues around QA with that maybe um, but I guess that's a, a, a topic for another day the next thing we need to do is contour the patient and this is another issue in terms of contouring the patient while they're on, on the treatment couch waiting for their treatment and clearly this is something that we can't do manually in real time and there's a, n a number of solutions out there now. I've just um, given two examples of, of the Varian and Electors uh, solutions so Smart, Adapt and Abass and essentially they're two ways of auto contouring um the the patient while they're on the couch as i say there's a number of vendors now making these and if you're interested in that there's, there's quite a bit of literature out there that, that that talks around that we then want to calculate the dose so traditionally um we uh, carry out some um we carry out some phantom testing on our linux in order to calibrate our um our profiles in order to calculate the dose on our CT scanner. Sorry, I said that on our Linux, I meant on our CT scanner. So we might use a, a phantom like this um, to, to, to do that. And actually, there's no reason why we can't do that on a cone beam scanner and um, and change the electron densities in our, in our profiles. So you can see here that this is an example of um, where they've done this. And they've uh, clearly this is just a phantom, so um, we always need to, I guess, be a little bit conscious of that. But they've calculated the dose on the a CT scan, um, their standard planning one, which is this one, and then they've used the cone beam scanner on a Linac to com, um, compare the differences in what the dose distribution looks like. And actually, to the naked eye, there's very, very little difference, I would say, 
Um, if you look very closely, there's a few subtle differences. And if you look up this this paper, they've got some um, a little bit more data in terms of how they've analysed that and, and and the differences. We then need to evaluate the plan. Again, we could do this manually, but actually, what we really want is some sort of automated system that. Uh, would do that using um, an algorithm and you can see that this is a patient where we're getting some tumor shrinkage throughout the treatment not a huge amount but even though we've not got a huge amount of change you can see the differences on the uh, dose volume histograms um, to the temporal lobe and also to the PTV coverage there so this really showing um, how how the patient's um, dose distribution can change over time we then need to re-optimize the plan and again this is another example of, of, of how that's done and you can see here this image isn't isn't that great unfortunately but this is for a prostate patient and if we look at the PTV this dotted line is what the PTV would be like if it wasn't re-optimized and this is what it is when it's re-optimized similarly the rectum what it's like if it wasn't re-optimized and what it was when it was re-optimized and so they're still not there's still slight differences between two, arguably quite a big difference there between the bladder, but they're much, much different, much better than they were if the plan hadn't been optimized. In terms of the benefits of maybe doing this, this is a, um, a nice paper that looks at head and neck cancer, and you can see it's looking at the volume of the tumour. Um, throughout a course of treatment for 15 patients and you can see although there's a general trend in terms of the tumor shrinking particularly if it started large you can see on some patients there's huge variation throughout treatment maybe due to inflammation again look at the lymph nodes um, not as much change but the the odd anomaly there with with that patient there and if we look at them as a, a percentage of their initial volume there's really um, you could I suppose you can see a trend there um, uh, for, for, for a lot of the patients really really unpredictable so really this is these patients are changing on a day-to-day -day basis and if we use comb beam CT we can actually actually see that similarly for lung cancer this is a, a nice paper that looked at 21 lung cancer patients and looked at the changes in the the ITV throughout treatment and you can see here again look at how how the the ITV changes most patients reducing in size but actually some patients increasing and, and in that patient 19 increasing quite considerably one thing that we can do I guess somewhere in the middle is a something that's been um, written about by a number of authors um, uh, what we might call plan of the day so th there's a number of papers that look at this in the bladder and essentially what we do is scan the patient um, with an empty bladder scan them with a full bladder use the planning system to interpolate some bladders in between so you can see it's not doing a symmetrical margin it's, it's growing them based on on the two original scans and then what the radiographers can do on a day-to-day -day basis is image uh, the patient using comb beam ct and then decide which image is the most appropriate which plan is the most appropriate so day one it might be plan three day two it might be plan four day five it might be plan one um, you get the idea so it's really a way of not having that full adaption on on set each day but a way of, of adapting the plan um, using a, a, a number of kind of base plans and you can see here that um, this is what would have happened if they'd used a the full bladder and this is what would happen if they'd have used the empty bladder compared to what actually happened and you can see here that um, if they'd used a full bladder scan then actually what happened on a day-to-day -day basis the uh, patient would have overdosed a small bowel if they'd used the empty bladder scan then you can see quite an underdose of the of the PTV there so the last thing I want to think about, and this is kind of really my baby, I suppose, in terms of training and development, and I'm sure this is something that we've all got something to add to. Um, I'm really just going to set the scene for this and open it to the floor. So these images are a little bit old, but they're taken from um, the clinical support program from 2012-13 that looked at uh, UK centres. And I think these pie charts tell a big story in terms of... Um, 
centers still developing their IGRT program and um, some centers having no IGRT program at all and some still developing that now I'm sure that's changed in the in the last few years but um, I'm sure there's still if we were to carry out that today kind of um, certainly anecdotal evidence would, would, would suggest to me that there's still huge variation across across centers in terms of that and um, some recommendations that they make at the end and I'd be interested to see whether you think we're actually doing this so it says radiotherapy service providers must work with HEIs to develop minimum requirements to enable new radiographers to be fit for purpose and that volumetric image analysis and digital decision making skills during undergraduate and postgraduate pre-registration should be standardized and that all education providers should um, adopt some sort of framework and they've suggested what in appendix 7 I'll let you look that up yourself if you're interested in that but it's actually quite short um, and I'd be interested to see what you think in terms of, of um, what you do in, in your centre I popped on a few slides for a little bit, bit of bedtime reading so these are things that I think are, are useful presentations some nice ones within them um, and so yeah if you want to find a little bit more these are probably a good a good place to start so what I'd like to do now as I've said is, is kind of open the floor to discussion um, I'll answer any questions uh, along with Rob the, and anyone else that's got anything they'd like to chip in so really I'd like anybody who's able to answer these questions to to, to get stuck in and, and, and share their thoughts and um, we'll go from there